conditioning back and forth. Oh, that's what it was. And um, <laughs> maybe hanging out occasionally with Nick and some of his assorted band of bandits. Hanging out with Nick Friedle today is Tim McMahon. Very happy to have two of our insiders with us. Coming up, Mavs owner Mark Cuban told the Dallas Morning News, now we have a bunch of super teams. Is he right? Just how many teams do we think could win it all? We will discuss. First, though, so how many times have you heard the expression player empowerment this last week or two? Ten times? A hundred times? Certainly the way Kawhi Leonard used his free agency to leverage the Clippers and the Thunder to complete one of the biggest asset swaps in NBA history, that's power. But as Bill Russell was honored with the Arthur Ashe Courage Award at last night's ESPYs, we were reminded that while, yes, we've certainly reached some new heights when it comes to players having more control over the league, none of this started this decade. Russell first embodied player empowerment just by taking the court in the 50s and 60s. Plenty of fans, and certainly some owners, simply did not want black players in their game. One year, fans broke into Russell's home spray-painted racist words on the walls of his family living room, smashed up his trophy case, and defecated in his bed. Russell was hurt and angry, but not bullied, nor was he cowed when he and his African-American teammates were denied hotel rooms or meals in some cities. Think about that. One of the most basic parts of being a professional athlete is traveling to play. And Russell was told time and time again, you do not belong here. This is not for you. And time and time again, he said, Actually, it is, and I am here, and there is nothing you can do about it. That is power. Russell displaying his inspired so many to take theirs. We talk about how LeBron going to Miami influenced other players to claim their own agency. Think about how other players were inspired watching Bill Russell, and not just players, actually. Here's what former President Barack Obama said in an interview with our ESPYs producers. The gift someone like Bill Russell gave to somebody like me is an expectation that, yeah, there's nothing I can't do. And I don't have to shrink myself or think that there's a ceiling to what I can accomplish. And Russell was just as towering off the court. He attended the March on Washington, traveled to Ku Klux Klan strongholds to run biracial basketball clinics, all at a time where, again, athletes were told, you will lose your job if you do this sort of thing. And again, Russell basically said, just try it. I have more power than you. And he did. Then in 1966, when legendary Celtics coach Red Auerbach was retiring to become the team's full-time GM, he asked Russell to take over. Russell not only became the first black head coach in any major U.S. sport, remember, he was also still playing at the time. You know how people will sometimes complain about the level of influence of today's superstars have and say, yeah, we know who's really coaching that team. Bill Russell was one of the stars of the Celtics and was literally coaching the team. That, my friends, is player empowerment. And Russell was, of course, hardly the only one as the years unfolded. We only have free agency in the NBA to begin with because in 1970, Oscar Robertson took the first steps by suing the NBA for it. Oh, and, and everyone up in arms about Anthony Davis or Paul George demanding a trade this year? They should remember that back in 1975, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar demanded a trade back off a Bucks team that had won a championship, telling management he wanted to go to, wait for it, New York or L.A. So, yeah, today's power players are embracing their agency like never before, and they should be. This is a game literally built on their sweat. But let last night also be a reminder, like with so many things, stars today are standing on the shoulders of giants like Bill Russell and are benefiting from the seeds he helped plant more than 50 years ago. Tim, how do you think owners are going to react to this sort of level of, of sort of agency these players are taking? Because it was interesting to have the Board of Governors meeting be so close mm -hmm. on the heels of free agency and the discussions we heard that came out of that about, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. And, and we'll see what happens with future uh, CBA discussions. But right now, I think owners who have the ability to create relationships with players have a bigger, have a significant advantage. You know, I, I, I look at a guy like Steve Ballmer, for example. I think mm -hmm. he's a guy who, you know, he's, he's not necessarily trying to hang out with the players and be their friends, but he's a guy who I, I think players kind of enjoy being around. So he's a guy that they want to work uh, for, you know, want to, in, in, in a way, work with. And, and like I said, I, I think the ability, the, the owners who have that ability to uh, create a rapport with players have an advantage in, in today's NBA.
Rich, I don't know what the fix is. Because as long as the monster TV checks come to all these owners all over the place, <laughs> what are they really going to do? They're going to say, Adam, I want a star on my team. And Adam Silver's going to say, you see that check that just came in? <laughs> and then they're going to be, oh, okay, you're right, you're right. It's going to be all right. So I, we can discuss guys not wanting to, to pair up together and, and pair up in the bigger markets. The idea of balance is good. The reality of it, I don't think, is attainable in this moment in time, though. Well, one place where players do have a lot more power than, say, in Bill Russell's time or Oscar Robertson's time is they have financial freedom. Mm -hmm. a lot more so than they had in the past. Outside endorsements and just the greater salaries overall, you talk about all those billions of dollars. The players, by the way, still not getting most of it, right? 50%, mm -hmm. um, but they do get a big chunk of it and therefore have a lot more financial freedom than say a Bill Russell did or anyone like that. And because of that, I just think the owners do think differently about how they want to uh, have stars be distributed around the league. Because regardless of whether you think more parity is good for the game or more of a star system is good for the game, however you want it to shake out, you can't bribe players anymore. And that has been the base of all of these CBAs, whether it was, oh, we're going to bribe them with eight-year or not eight, eight year contracts, right? That'll, that'll keep them. They'll never seen this much money before. Right. Oh, we're going to bribe them with a Supermax. I've seen all this stuff. How can we tinker with a Supermax to make it really work to keep players? That starts with the baseline assumption that players don't have enough of their own agency that they can just be bribed to stay places. And I don't think that model, if maybe it did work when players didn't get as much of a percentage of revenue, it, it, it's not going to work now. Look at how much money Kawhi Leonard left on the table, right? First in San Antonio, then in Toronto. It, it just hasn't worked. And I, I think that... You don't want true parity in the NBA, but even if you do say, hey, we want more of a redistribution, I don't like these guys tr demanding trades or, or asking to form their super teams, you have to stop trying to do it with money. Absolutely. It's like uh, Liam Neeson and Taken. Good luck. <laughs> 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 Truly, I'm, I'm listening through and I'm going, have fun with that. Because guys, even more so than not needing the money, Rach, they want to play with each other. They'll do whatever it takes that, so that they're not on an island by themselves playing with a group of guys that doesn't have close to their talent level. They want to compete for titles. They know that that's where the legacy is, and they want to enjoy playing with each other in the moment. So good luck to the league in trying to find a way to find balance. I think in this era, more so than we've seen ever, really, this is a time when guys have the control. They know they have the control. They have the money to back their decisions and they feel more empowered than ever. Yeah, I, you know what, though? I think going into the season, the league is as balanced as it's been in a long time. I mean, there's a longer list of legitimate contenders uh, this summer than certainly uh, over the last five years when it, it always, you know, obviously the Raptors ended up winning, but it felt at this point last year that it was just destiny that the Warriors would defend their championship. And, you know, we're talking about small market teams at disadvantages. Utah's a legitimate contender. They've built that through draft, through trade, getting a big-time free agent for them in, in Bogdanovich. I, Milwaukee, I just, obviously. I is, just want to point out the screen because this illustrates your point so much, Tim. Mark Cuban said today, or this was in the Dallas Morning News, in terms of movement, it's great for the NBA. Now, instead of one super team, everyone's trying to beat, and then LeBron's an attraction. I don't know how he's going to take that description, but anyway. Um, now we've got a bunch of super teams, and even those super teams only have two superstars. None of them have the three that I've been able to count. It takes a little bit of luck, and it takes building a team. So go on. Yeah, and look, if Kawhi had gone to the Lakers, I, that would not have been good for the league because it would have been like, well, everybody's playing uh, for second place. Him going to the Clippers, now you've got this great inner city rivalry. Uh, and again, I, to me, I'm looking at the league right now. There's seven legit contenders. Uh, that I see. Add Brooklyn to that list once KD gets back, uh, you know, next season, not this coming up season, but the season after that. I, I feel like the league is in, is in a great place, and you've got contenders in major markets, and then you've got some small market teams that are in that mix. Okay, so do we really have multiple teams that can win the title? Do you guys think Mark's right? We don't have that many, and I disagree with Cuban in this. I don't believe we have a lot of super teams. We have a lot of very good teams. We have more balance than we've had in a while, but super teams to me, that's three Hall of Famers on the same roster, or more in the Warriors' case. But super teams, we have, we have teams that have a couple stars. <laughs> we don't have all these teams that are just going to run and dominate over everybody else. That's the part as a fan that I'm looking forward to next year. But, Rach, I'm looking at the, the rosters, and I'm looking at how these teams are set up. 
I don't think there are that many teams that have a legit chance to win it all. I think you've got a lot of teams that have a chance to to win a lot of games, but to win it all, I uh, I don't know. Like I I, I see seven. I see uh, yeah, th- th- there's a list. I would add the uh, I would add the Nuggets to that list. Um, so who are you taking off if you see seven? Well, the the Warriors. That depends on how Clay is able to come back from his knee injury. You know, going into the season. Uh, without Clay, I don't think you can count the Warriors as a legit contender. Now, if he comes back and is, you know, full fledged Clay Thompson, uh, you know, with Steph, with Draymond, see how D'Angelo. Have Russell we seen the back end of that roster? <laughs> Anybody who's run into the window this year to bet on the Warriors to win it all? Can we all just take a deep uh, you, breath? You know what, though? Ay, ay, ay. You, you think maybe the Warriors will be an attractive uh, alternative for for guys who are in the buyout market? You you think they're going to be able to fill out that roster? Obviously, they're the hard cap. Be top of the list. Oh, that's a fair point. See, I thought you were going to say they're attractive for Warriors fans who finally want to place a bet they can get some returns on. <laughs> Don't do it this year, please. But like the Rockets, we, we think well, that the Rockets are going to go. I was going to ask Mr. Rockets over there. What do you think, Rockets insider? No, uh, the Rockets, they're they are on the list. I mean, they're, all these teams in the West have made significant upgrades around them, and they're kind of, you know, the, the repeat of running back. Although, you know, let's wait to see how this <laughs> rust situation uh, plays out. I still think there is a at least a, a small chance there that he ends up uh, in Houston. But look, the Rockets are the one team in the West that challenged the Warriors the last two years. Uh, I think it's foolish to say, oh, they couldn't beat this, you know, great dynasty, or oh, their, their window is closed. You know, uh, as much as Daryl Morey was trying to to swing for the fences with Jimmy Butler and all that, people I've talked to, executive scouts, they think they're that the Rockets are better off. You know, maintaining this core, running it back. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Mike D'Antoni uh, feels <laughs> that way as well. And yeah, the Rockets are absolutely contenders, despite all the drama, despite some of the, the friction uh, on the roster. I mean, they were right there the last two years. Did Chris Paul get younger? No, I don't. I don't think that's the way. It, Nick, I don't think that's the way that, that works. <laughs> I, I mean, I watched. This is the part that kills me. I watched that series. Chris Paul was flopping all over the place, all over the place in that Warriors series. And I'm going, is this the same guy? And now we're going to say, no, no, no. Oh, what you think? Chris Paul I, just started I was flopping. Gonna, no, like, but I mean, something new? but he's flopping because he if can't gonna, do anything. If you're going to pull right something, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the thing to pull as a sign of advancing age. I thought he had some very good games during that series. And then I had some game seven. That I that game he would seven. Like he was very good. But if you're telling me that. Or game okay. six, excuse me. Excuse me. We're all a little <laughs> hazy <laughs> after uh, the game night. Was was yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a quick break before things get much, much worse here. We are going to go back to Vegas where things get hot inside Thomas and Mac Arena during Knicks Lakers. That'll be after this break. First, though, it's time for our distant replay from this date, 2010, Just featuring JaVale McGee. Every single night. Good defense. Yeah. Well, 